Um, thanks everyone for staying. I know it wasn't for me because we didn't get to get your certificate. Uh, with the pandemic, because my talk will be on pandemics and pests, uh, masks made an upsurge in sales, and lucky for me, people made insect masks. So I bought a few. Uh, the one here. I, I brought some insects along, so you have to come. I mean, insects along alive, but also prepared ones, so we'll have them after the presentation tonight, and we can have some drinks and have some crickets at the same time. <laughs> While the cat's away, the mice will play. And we had a few speakers preceding me who did speak about mice. And this was a problem twice, I know, in New South Wales, Australia. The mouse infestation was of biblical proportions. Uh, they stink, whether they're alive or dead, you can't escape the smell sometimes, it's oppressive, but we are resilient. There's a lot of mice here. That there was a, um, a drought, and these uh, mice were consuming bales of hay and all kinds of grain, things stored by farmers in New South Wales. By the billions. So, and uh, we don't have, we don't really need the uh, sportscaster here speaking about this, a newscaster, about how billions of mice were running rampant over everywhere, and they were consuming uh, lots of the stored, you know, and, um, food people had, the uh, stored bales of hay, the grains, and um, the farmers were relying on local agriculture people to, uh, that's funny, it picked up at the end. Well, they were relying on getting some money because this was over and above what they could spend on trying to get rid of these animals. And yeah, he lost as much as 2,500 bales. He was trying to get money from the council, but it was very difficult. Wow. And yeah, it's worse than, it's worse than the 1984 mice plague. So that means it happened before, and now it's tw spring of 2021. Happened again. So I don't know if you've had that many rodents in your accounts where you can sort of shovel them out. Uh, I'll go over a few definitions to um, sort of uh, parallel what my presentation is on pandemics and pests. So, the epidemic is a population of damaging insects and pathogens that build up often rapidly to injuriously high levels. An epidemic is synonymous with outbreak. A pandemic is an epidemic occurring on a scale that crosses international boundaries usually affecting people on a worldwide scale. So it's not just a disease, but it has to be something that's widespread, but it also has to be infectious. And there's a definition later about cancer that's worldwide, but it's not an infectious disease. What? Um, oh, sorry, yeah, um, I can't fix that. <laughs> A person in technical stuff here would have to fix it. I'm not sure if it's the connection. That was quick. I got it. Oh. Might be in the settings. Hmm? Might be in the settings. Uh, but for now, before it's up in the back, you can still see if, you, if you're far-sighted enough. <laughs> and you know, I'll try to just go over it. Uh, but um, and by now you've read it, I don't have to bother because we have to have a problem with time. And Andy will pull me off if I'm not done in time. But if you look at the 1918-1919, Pandemic flu, that was where 40 million people died in less than a year. Uh, 
or the Black Plague, Black Death, or the plague that was uh, flea-borne. It actually is disease in fleas, and the first um, things that get infected are the rats, because those particular fleas are feeding on rats. Uh, these are various epidemics, but not um, mosquito-borne, not arthropod-borne, let's say, not tick-borne, but just um, diseases that are transferred uh, from person to person in many cases. However, however, the Black Death, which Stan pointed out earlier, there were other ways of it transferring, not just from fleas. Here it is now. Uh, the bacteria is Yersinia pestis. It was called, it had different uh, genus before. And um, it's fever, weakness, headache, so that, and that's after infection. So those symptoms um, actually can be attributed to many different things. You wouldn't know what the problem is unless you check back on what did that person do, where was that person. There are three forms of it, mnemonic, which is the one Stan was talking about, a person can transfer it to a person. Bubonic plague, which are the lymph, affects the lymph node, making them swell, uh, swell, and it's called buboes. That's the reason for calling it bubonic plague. And septicemic plague affects the blood, and uh, tissues turn black, which is necrosis, and those die. As I pointed out earlier, that plague is transferred by the bite of a flea, Neopolis keopis, or, the, or you know, rat flea. Uh, the part around in the asterisks are very interesting how it's transferred. The bacteria multiply inside the flea, sticking together to form a plug that blocks its stomach and causes it to starve. The flea then bites a host and continues to feed, even though it cannot quell its hunger. Consequently, the flea vomits blood painted with the bacteria back into the bite wound. The bubonic plague bacteria then infects a new person, and the flea eventually dies from starvation. So it's not the greatest thing for the flea. It's very different from ticks, very different from diseases transferred by mosquitoes, since that's going uh, through their salivary system, but it doesn't kill them. And um, you have trichomine metaviate bugs, which transmit American trypanosomiasis, and that's not through a bite, that's through the rectal area. They bite, they feed on you, the feces are on your skin, it itches because of the bite, you scratch it, you scratch that disease, bacteria, into you. So even though people ask me, well, how about bed bugs, can't they transfer diseases? And in nature, not really. And they're also the related trichomine retivides the ones that are not good vectors because they don't make you itch and they don't defecate on you when they feed on you. Even though the bacterium that they have could infect you, but the behavior doesn't really infect you. Uh, this is just a listing of different pandemics. The asterisk one in the center are arthropod-born. In fact, they're mosquito-born. Dengue fever, malaria, and yellow fever. So in order to control the disease, you can control the vector of that disease. You have to know the biology of that vector to know what's the best way to get rid of it. Uh, in certain insects, you might say it's best to hit the egg stage, the larval stage, or the stage, or the adult stage. Or you can try to hit all of them, depending on what research has shown. So this is dengue fever, and the uh, mosquito and Aedes aegypti also can transmit the other fevers too. And a related one, a filariasis, that's a worm, so it can transmit a worm, parasitic worm. Malaria, Stan hit earlier, uh, and you'll note that they have common names for these because the um, disease, malaria, affected many specific places around the world. In fact, 
It was brought to the Americas along with the slave trade. And it devastated the Jamestown colony. It was almost like what um, Stan talked about. Who was that? Um, that, fr that French person, you know? Where he made the big mistake of not knowing what to do. Napoleon. Yes, and not knowing what to do. And he just went for it. And he had all that trouble with disease because he really didn't know about it and subjected hundreds of thousands of his men to death. Uh, yellow fever. And now COVID-19 is pandemic, but it's not vectored by any insects or mites. And for how it affected you is what happens when regular weekly monthly service such as monitoring, identifying, and controlling pest species drop off to points where it is non-existent. Hotels closed down temporarily, some restaurants turned to take out business, but some had it just closed. Some just locked the door, food was just left in the refrigerator, freezer, or on the shelves, and electricity may have gone off. Business offices were closed, people held commuted, museums had restriction, restricted employee attendance, and zero public access. So we're going to look how COVID-19 affected your, the pests in buildings, in homes, businesses, museums, everywhere. All in less than an hour. Uh, cockroach populations, if not monitored and managed, overwhelm the staff uh, when everything started up again. The three main roach species was American, German and brown banded. Uh, other insects were webbing clothes moths, different carpet beetles, and stored product pests were various beetles and moths. And also mold and moisture insects, silverfish, book lice, lacidia beetles, and some other small tiny beetles that are also associated uh, with moisture and mold and fungus. And Biting arthropods like bed bugs, parasitic rodents, and bird mites were problems. So these are the four picture of four common roaches you probably have seen. Um, an oriental roach is sexually dimorphic, so this is a female, not the male. And the brown banded is also this is a female and not the male, because the male would be more elongated. Uh, pest species of roaches are pests because they're typically introduced from a foreign source, and that's why they're pests. Um, people in other parts of the country have had Blatella asahine and Blatella vega, and they look a lot like Blatella germanica, same genus, just different species. They look different if you know them, you treat them differently, and they also behave differently where you have the other species of Blatella can fly, where the German cockroach may flutter around, but it doesn't really fly, and also those are attracted to light. So knowing their behavior gives you the idea that, hmm, maybe I'm not really dealing with this pest, I'm dealing with something completely different. The Parcoblata species are field roaches. So you might find them, but they're not really domiciliary or domiciliary. They don't really have domestic pests. They may come in, but, but they're not really something that's going to be in your facility. The Oothica, uh, of course, are the eight cases of cockroaches. Certain ones will carry them, that's a German, for a uh, long period of time until it glues it down and almost might hatch while she's carrying it. The American may drop it pretty much right away and glues it in place. They all glue them in place. The roaches I brought along today are actually live-bearing roaches. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's actually technically not a live-bearing. There is one species of cockroach where it's a uterus inside, and the, the embryos are kept alive, connected that way. But these roaches have the oothica Inside their body, they simply extend it out and bring it all the way back into a brood area, and they incubate, uh, and that is why when those roaches are born, they simply come out as little nymphs, and they are just 
dropped by the female, and they'll crawl out from the mass of the hatching old fecal. So this is a German, and it shows you nymphs, shows you an fika, a female with the ovifica in, and then there's a male. Roaches, as you realize, of course, have cersei at the end, so nymph roaches aren't bed bugs, but a lot of people in general population uh, will find roaches thinking they have bed bugs. But once you look at the parts of the specimen they give you, if you look for these specific structures on the body, you can tell them, no, it's not a dead bug, don't worry about it. But, but you do have roach problem, so we'll do something like that. Uh, just a simple blue board sample of collected cockroaches. Uh, this is a uh, collected, well not a collected, it's a uh, in situ on a shelf I had examined, pulled out the CDs, and there were roaches living in the shelf, the person knew that. But you'll notice also, there were bed bugs living on that shelf too. And there were droppings of both bed bugs and cockroaches. Uh, the cockroach nymph on the left is brown banded, the nymph on the right is a German cockroach. So two species, and here's the uh, brown banded, showing the male, which is winged, and the non-winged, really female, well, short winged, female, and then the nymph stages, and the egg case. So here's a, the roach on the top, this is from a lab I had at the museum. So the roach on the top in the center is not one of the domestic roaches, it's one of the pets I have. And it got out and get, it got caught. <laughs> this is just different pictures showing you the Turkestan roach, which is now, it was called Lata lateralis, but it's actually called now Schultz-Fordella lateralis. But you'll notice it's also dimorphic the male on top is light brown and long winged. The female is short winged and darker brown. And this is the oriental. You'll notice the male in the center with the longer wings and the female on the left with the stubbier wing pads. And just showing you when you find light colored cockroaches, it's not a new thing. It's just that one is molted. This has some spiders and cockroaches. Um, I don't have a close-up shot, but I think these spiders look like a recluse spider. And it's not a brown recluse, but it is the um, Loxosceles rufescens, a Mediterranean recluse. So we do have those in the city. Uh, I've caught them in different locations, using blue boards. Uh, this is just showing you a cockroach, and all of you know it, but you see sort of characteristic structures of the spiny tibia, uh, five segmented tarsus and claw, and the cerci, which are the segmented sensory structures of the rear end. They're different in different row species. Some have short ones, some have more elongate ones. Uh, and the American cockroach here was feeding on this book, and you can see the droppings next to the ruler I set up. And here you can see that American cockroach nymph feeding on a food item, using the palpi to touch and taste the food. And this is one of the pet roaches. You can see in action how the palpi are used and how it chews into this pear. And if you've uh, seen the caterpillars I brought in today, Manduca sexta tobacco hornworms, this is a, uh, a different cockroach, another blabberid cockroach, and uh, it's one of the live bearing ones where the old beak is kept inside and the young come out as little nymphs. But you'll notice there is a caterpillar on the left. These were dead caterpillars. And you'll see what, how active and how, how excited they are about this great protein source. Ball and sort of came over and started chewing and pulling on this dead caterpillar. Just another uh, view of these um, oothica and how the young are popping out. That's during birth. And uh, this shows one of the oothica with the nymph just emerged. And this shows a parasitic wasp that was as a larva feeding on the roaches that were inside this oothica. This, uh, 
I'll show a picture of that. But this is American cockroach oothica, like the other one was. And the Oriental and American are both hosts for this particular wasp species. It's an ensign wasp. If you find these wasps in glue boards and accounts, you know you have a roach problem. But you wouldn't have the wasp there if the roaches weren't there. They have very characteristic, tiny, flat like which is the name ensign wasp, rear end. That's the abdomen. And this is a yellowfin wasp. If you find these, they're very small, as you see, compared to the size of a oothica. But they're also endoparasites. They put the ovipositor in, put eggs in, and the developing larvae feed on the nymph roaches developing inside it. Just a size orientation for the uh, roaches of the ones that I was showing you. And you see the white ones here, those are the ones that just molted, so they haven't hardened, haven't tanned yet. Now into office spaces. There's infested food in this office space right inside that doorway. So as I think Bill and uh, the different rodentology people spoke, when you go to accounts, you should go through and clean up all the rodent baits that are left there. Because rodent baits don't affect insects. Insects love to eat them, it's a food source. All kinds of rodent baits. These are cigarette beetles. They love rodent baits. These are not ants. I've had more people tell me they found ants and they have bed bugs because they have bites all over them. When in fact, these are wasps. These are parasitic, ectoparasitic wasps, um, a bacillid wasp uh, that attack the um, larva and pupa of those developing beetles, and sometimes the moths like Indian meal moths. Uh, the larvae of these feed externally and consume the pupa and the larvae. The females are typically wingless. Males will have wings. Females are ant-like, but they're not ants. There's no pedicel with um, a one or two segmented node. And the uh, ovipositor, or the sting actually, is exerted out, and you can see it sticking out. And for some unknown reason, they'll crawl around if they're in someone's home, and when they get on you, they start jabbing, and injecting a little venom in And the reaction is misinterpreted as a bed bug bite. So bed bugs also shouldn't be defined by the skin reaction people have on their skin, because that can be lots of different reasons for it. This woman um, told me she had a pest control in and they were, she has bed bugs and they were finding uh, uh, ants and putting ant feed out everywhere. And I knew this is a good spot to go because I'll find those bacillid wasps. And I did. And she was stung in different areas on her body as they crawled, the female wasp crawled around, crawled up into her bed and just were on her and jabbing her. This is a Trogoderma. This is one of the domestic beetles. This is in a box of uh, oatmeal. The beetles uh, consume the food inside the oatmeal and then bore holes out of the cardboard to leave. And we're going to, they shed their skins and then we're going to pupate. And usually a lot of these beetles leave an area first uh, from the food source in order to pupate. You'll notice that there's little brushy areas at the rear ends of the beetle. And, like in this beetle here, which is another kind, uh, these are also anthrax beetles, or the other ones that you'll find in homes and businesses. This type of skin reaction would be misinterpreted as bed bug bites. These are actually a reaction uh, to these hastaceae, which are the spearheaded seedy that occur in tufts um, on this beetle, which you're missing a lot of the tufts, but you can see them at the rear end. Like on, on this Trogoderma here. So what's the, name, what's the name of that beetle? This is one of the carpet beetles. It's a domestic beetle. It's, 
This one uh, is supposed to be a tromoderma on top, but it looks a bit more like a ianthrinus on the bottom. So those are, I forget the common names of, sorry, a lot of the beetles, but carpet beetles are, the, are like tromoderma, um, adagenus, which is black carpet beetle, that one's um, a few others. I'll, I'll kind of show you some of those. Uh, this is a chocolate on a uh, glue board, and this was hit by Orizophilus beetles. This one looks like um, Orizophilus mucator, which is merchant name beetle. So you can tell these have a little toothy area on the side of the pronotal. So it's either a merchant brain beetle or a, uh, what's the other brain beetle? Sawtooth. Sawtooth, yes, because they're white, it's all empty. Listen. Uh, the difference between them has to do with the relative size of the eye, to the rear end, of behind the eye of their head. One being a smaller space and a larger eye, one being a smaller eye and a larger space. Also in nuts, so you might come across a lot of these things, but these are the, the uh, materials you should look into when you see a person's home if they found particular insects. You can see how this nut's been chewed out in the center. This is another one of those beetles, and you can see the frass in this walnut. And here, walnuts with the frass and the insects living inside. You might find larvae, you might find pupa, you might find adults. And you might find the adults far from the infestation because, of course, they do. Certain ones will fly, certain ones will crawl. Um, pasta, holes. This is Rizopertha dominica. This is one of the, the uh, Bostricid beetle grain pests. The other Bostricid beetles, you might know from wood boring beetles. And in fact, Lictus beetles, instead of being in the family Lictidae, are now in the family Bostricidae. These are brooded beetles. Their whole life, except for the adult, is spent inside one of these beans. So it develops as a larval stage in there. The eggs have been laid by females. Some of the eggs you can see on the surface. Uh, the larvae feed on that, and then emerge as adults. These were once called uh, weevils, like seed weevils, but they're actually Chrysanella leaf beetles. They're very distinctive with their sort of antenna, multi-segmented, a little enlarged, the tip, and a heavy femur. Blue boards, these collected weevils. These are real weevils, a granary or rice weevil or maize weevils. And the insect here is actually a plaster beetle. That's the small one right here. This is a Tenebriani beetle. I brought Large Zophobus tenebrionid beetles here, that's a giant mealworm. And if you were, uh, if you really wanted to, you could stick your hand inside and get a handful just to see what it feels like to have them all crawling around. Mm. <laughs> and you might not. Okay. These are uh, Alphatobius diaparinus, called the lesser mealworm. It usually likes, um, in a natural or a natural setting, chicken coops, and it feeds often on all the droppings from chickens in the chicken coop. It overwhelms the farmer, and they have to go get rid of his problem. But uh, these were pictures taken in New York City, in Queens, I think it was, of an issue. And the person here, they had these beetles in the ceiling lighting system. And you say, that's kind of weird. Why? And, and also, they like uh, moldy kind of grains, too. Well, living upstairs were pigeons, just like you have chickens, and they were having a shitload of a great city there. You know? That's a scientific. So, 